I'm Chad Main, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal innovation and legal technology. Today's episode, I'm talking to Professor Dan Lenna. He's a senior lecturer and director of law and technology initiatives at the Northwestern Pritzker School of Law and the McCormick School of Engineering. We talk legal education, AI, and the intersection of computer science and the law. Today's show is a broad-ranging conversation with Professor Dan Lenna. He's a professor at both Northwestern's law school and its engineering school. He also heads up Northwestern's Legal Innovation Lab that pairs both law students, students from computer science and engineering schools, with law firms and companies to use technology to solve challenging legal problems. Prior to Northwestern, Dan held positions at both the University of Michigan and Michigan State. But Dan is not Ivory Tower. Before he was a professor, he was a lawyer for 10 years at a large law firm, and in a prior life, he was an information technology manager. But he always knew he was going to be a lawyer. I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer, right? That, this is something, but, you know, if you'd asked me why, I couldn't necessarily, I think, tell right. you exactly why I wanted to be a lawyer. And I was always interested in innovation. You know, I remember as a kid, I, we would go to like Henry Ford Museum in D- Detroit and I'd get these books about Thomas Edison and things like that. And I grew up on a farm in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And so we always had, wow. we had lots of things around that I could like build things and test things and try things. And so little engineering and electronics kits. And then when personal computers started to become a thing, my dad worked in education and, um, you know, we were fortunate to have a, a computer at a, at a pretty young age for me. What model? What was your first computer? Uh, an Apple II uh, Plus we had for a little while, and then an Apple IIe shortly after that. Yeah. I had a VIC-20. I'm going to go way back. I had a VIC-20 back in the day. Yeah. After a while, I had a Commodore 64, right? You know, like that was, yeah. you know, that was great. You know, there was a lot. Of- 64, that was, that blew doors off the VIC-20. I mean, think about that. Because 64, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's right, incredible. right. So you end up going to law school. Then you have a career at a big firm, Honigman, for, for several years before you get into legal education. What was it that made you want to make the jump from the practice of law to legal education? I had just made equity partner at Honigman. I've been practicing for almost 10 years. I had a judicial clerkship in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, Federal Sixth Circuit. And uh, the timing was just right. I mean, I'd been teaching as an adjunct at the University of Michigan Law School. That's where I went to law school. I started teaching negotiation there, I, and I taught also some uh, law and technology sort of course. And I was teaching as an adjunct at Michigan State. And the opportunity to join Michigan State full time came up. And you know, it always been in the back of my mind that I would maybe enjoy a full time role in academia. So when that role came up, I just thought, well, now's the right time to do this because I just made equity partner. There's still a lot of work to do to like build a, a big book of business, right? I had some business at, at, the, at that point in time, but not tons. And I thought, no, hey, I can go do this. And if I decide I want to go back to practice, I thought it would be relatively easy to go back to Honigman or go to another firm. So that was what you know drew me initially to make the, the, the full time switch. When you get out of law school, you hear like, if you want to be a professor, you just, you better work on that now because Law schools don't like practitioners to come back and teach. It's hard to get a job. Did you find that any kind of bias or that make it harder on you to to get a full-time position because you were a practicing attorney for 10 years? Well, this is a whole other show in itself, Chad, talking about. You know, know, I think that there's different tracks inside of law schools, right? I mean, and, and every law school is a little bit different. You know, there's clinicians, you have clinics, there's tenure track faculty, there's faculty who come from practice, there's adjunct faculty. You know, generally speaking, I think today more and more tenure track faculty tend to be folks who, you know, practice for a very short period of time or more and more uh, to get a, a teaching job in a law school, you have a PhD, usually in one of the social science fields, but there's you know, the law and computation, computer science and law is becoming more and more uh, common. So I think there's different pathways to getting here and there's different kind of groups uh, of faculty in law schools kind of more or less focused on, on one thing or another. And so you're at Michigan State for a while, and then a position opens up at Northwestern. How'd that come about? Well, I got to know Dan Rodriguez. Uh, I got to know him through Twitter, actually, initially, like some of the initial conversations. And so I, I, I would get over to Chicago pretty often when I was at Michigan State 
to run um, the Chicago Legal Innovation Meetup and and then to come to different conferences and things like that here. And I got to know Dan Rodriguez, met with Dan Rodriguez, invited Dan Rodriguez to come to a conference at Michigan State. And he actually hired me to come on a visit, a one-year visit here. There was a new dean, Kim Yurako. Dean Yurako then gave me the my first contract after that. And uh, yes, yeah, so and I'm going on, this year will be my fifth year at Northwestern. So now you don't just have one year temporary contract. You teach several classes. A lot of them deal with AI, but what are the classes you teach at Northwestern? I think one of the things that was really attractive to me about Northwestern is there was a, a relationship between the law school and several other schools on campus, particularly strong relationship with the engineering school, McCormick School of Engineering. And um, I got to meet the engineering dean, Dean Julio Atino, and he was very excited about this space. And my my position is actually the director of law and technology initiatives with a joint appointment in the law school and the, the engineering school in the computer science department specifically. And so I, I teach some classes in the engineering school The classes that are just in the engineering school tend to be law of technology. I teach law and the governance of AI, an introduction to law and digital technologies class. Uh, Within the law school, when we talk about law and tech in law schools, usually people tend to think about the law of technology. And I teach a couple classes like that. Uh, I teach law of AI and robotics. So just exposing students to how AI and robotics are, are regulated, how tort law applies to AI and robotics, things like that. But there's a growing number of courses and research and, well, you know, we see legal tech out in the real world, uh, so around using data and technology to deliver legal services. I teach AI and legal reasoning, getting our students to think about how these technologies are actually changing the way we practice as lawyers. How does having data available going to change the way you litigate? Uh, how is using different computational tools going to change the way we draft contracts, the way we, the analytics we use to determine the types of clauses to put into contracts. And then probably kind of like the, you know, the marquee class and the law and technology initiative around these things is our innovation lab class. And I teach that with Chris Hammond, uh, who's been a, a, law, uh, a computer science professor for a long time, has deep expertise in AI. He, he had a startup with Larry Birnbaum, uh, narrative science, very successful company that it grew into. But Chris and I teach the innovation lab and we have law students and computer science students in that class. They work on interdisciplinary teams and actually develop a prototype technology tool. They work, they partner with people from law firms, corporate legal departments. We've done a project with the Dominican Republic Supreme Court, uh, with the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. So a variety of areas where someone comes to us with hey, we have this need. We, we think technology or data analytics can help us improve service delivery in a particular space. And then this team, this interdisciplinary team of computer science and law students develops the prototype technology solution. I think I was going over your last cohort. But there were some big names, big law firms, big companies. But it made me wonder, I think you kind of just alluded to it there is, is it the, let's just say I'm a law firm, I'm a, a big law firm, and I see a legal problem that I think can be automated or we can throw tech at. Like for, for instance, one I saw was there was a law firm that came to this school and they wanted a product that helped doctors answer some compliance questions to figure out if they had to do certain things legally. So do the ideas come from the third parties outside the school, the firms, the companies, or is it something that students come up with and then go to these companies and law firms and say, Hey, I got this idea. Are you on board? Well, Matter of fact, the, the class actually first started before I came to Northwestern. And when they taught it previously, um, Leslie Oster and Esther Barron at the law school taught some earlier iterations. And they had students coming up with different ideas uh, for, for products. And, and that worked pretty well. But one of the things that we observed is that it was sometimes difficult for the students to identify concretely kind of where there might really be the opportunity. Right. Because right. they're, they're not facing it yet, right? I mean, they're not in the real world yet, like knowing when these problems come up. Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, that's when we decided that, well, what if we, I mean, now some of the ideas are ones that Chris Hammond and I have identified where, like example, contracts. Okay. We think there's a real opportunity in the contract space to 
do analytics on contracts, to create tools or draft contracts. And we've worked on a few different projects in that space, uh, including this last iteration, we worked with Mayor Brown on tools to improve drafting contracts. So we have expertise, we have, we have lawyers and uh, legal operations, legal technologists at Mayor Brown that we're working closely with, with our, our student team to create a prototype solution. Some of the other projects, like we worked with uh, McGuire Woods and Honigman on two different healthcare projects where it was more around an expert system sort of uh, of tool, kind of like thinking about, well, this is the advice, this is the problems that clients come to us with, could we create a product around that to, to deliver this? Um, and so that has worked really well because you know, having that expertise for the students to tap into and the really deep knowledge. This is one of the problems I think we have with a lot of these technologies and particularly in the long term where I want to see us go is that all too often we're looking at these problems so narrowly, right? And we're trying to kind of get in a space where we can think broader and really think longer term, like, well, where are we really trying to go? What do we think the possibilities are? And then Let's create a space where we can build a prototype. We can, we can create a little bit of space. You know, it's not like the students are being treated just like a development team. We ask the external stakeholders to come to us with something that, you know, we, we've identified a problem, but we think here's some ideas on how we might be able to solve it, right? So we want to give the students space to really explore the problem and really think about like, but well, who's the user? Who's going to use this thing? Who are the other stakeholders, right? Let's, let's really learn about what we think is going on here so we can actually develop something that can provide some value and that will actually be adopted and used as well. I assume it's an iterative process then. So the, the law firm or the company comes to the school, the student says, hey, we think there's something here. We've got a problem that maybe could be solved with tech. Then the students go to work on it, and I assume they go back to the law firm or the company and get feedback. Is that kind of the, the back and forth? Yeah. Ideally, we have them meet with their project partners once a week, or you know, maybe sometimes they do two weeks. But we try to get them. We train them up a little bit in agile. Uh, project management, you know, the product development, and we get them to, to put together a Kanban board. Uh, this is really great, right? Because the students generate all these ideas and different things, and we really get them to right. create a backlog. Which, by the way, those are perfect for legal project management too. So this is a good skill that for them to have. Right, exactly. Yes, that's what we're really trying to get them to think about is, is to learn some of these skills that they can apply. I mean, Maybe uh, several of these uh, law students in particular might not do anything directly related to this, but they're going to manage, manage projects, right? And we want right. them to help develop these, these skills. We try to run one-week sprints, right? Like get them thinking about, because some of these problems are really difficult, big problems, but getting away from thinking like, well, I have to deliver a full solution to thinking about, well, what's, what's a meaningful step? that you need to be able to accomplish to be able to solve this bigger problem, right? Let's break it down and, and just think about, you know, what could you do in this next week when you come back and demo to your, your project partner? Now, are these products then put into use in the real world by the firms? The goal for some of them is to is testing, right? One of, one of the challenges we have here is, is of course, we want to see the things that we do in the, the law and technology space actually put in the real use. But then we also have to understand that some of this, right, this idea of failing fast, right, and experimenting, we want to try things. We want to learn from the things that we're trying. But absolutely, that is part of the goal here, right? When we work with, with, with a large law firm and they're, they're putting time into this or a legal aid organization, right? We, we work with a lot of different stakeholders. You know, we appreciate that we have plenty of project partners who are willing to give back and, and work with our students. We really appreciate that. But we really want this to be a win-win. And that has to mean that the things that we're developing are something that they can really learn from and either put that specific tool in the practice or some component of what they've you know, developed in that, that tool will go into, into use at least. When we come back, Dan tells us about his research projects and how tech can and should be used to tackle access to justice issues. I'm Chad Main, and you're listening to Technically Legal. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient, legal services powered by technology. We'll get back to my conversation with Dan Lynn in just a second. But if you want to subscribe, you can find us pretty much wherever you get podcasts. If you want to get a hold of me, 
You can email me at cmain at precipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at precipient.co. Or you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Also, for every episode of Technically Legal at tlpodcast.com, there's a dedicated episode page with links to some of the stuff we talk about and more information about our guests. All right, let's get back to my conversation with Dan Linna. He's going to tell us about some research projects he's working on. Yeah, something that I'm working on right now that I'm really excited about is I'm working with Sabine Brunswicker, uh, Dr. Sabine Brunswicker, who is a uh, is a researcher at Purdue, and she has been on a visit here at, at Northwestern Kellogg, and we are working on designing a randomized controlled trial where we're going to test a conversational AI that gives uh, legal guidance to tenants. And the idea that I've done a fair bit of research around this idea of how do we evaluate legal services delivery? We don't really have standards for thinking about the, measuring the quality of a legal document, for example, or the value that that document provides. And part of our mission for the Law and Technology Initiative is, is we want to, to develop technologies that will improve access to justice, right? Um, we're also looking at, at how do we just develop technologies to improve access to legal services generally, right? Whether it's corporations or, or big law firms. And then we're also looking at the regulation of computational technologies. But on this access to justice part of it, right, we'll sometimes hear debates about, well, you can't use technology for that, right? They need a human lawyer to give them advice. And it's like, well, well, how do we know that? Right? What are our, what are our standards? How do we evaluate? Yeah, who who's saying that? Where, where's that coming from? That sounds like a real parochial, you know, protecting the the business. But the fact of the matter is, these business needs are going unmet. They don't have people helping them out. Right. That's exactly right. Right. I mean, the stats are about eighty six percent of people who need a lawyer don't get a lawyer. Things like that. I do think it's incumbent upon us, and this is something that I think academia can offer is to keep shoring up the case and, and providing the data and being more rigorous about testing these solutions that we're, that we're developing. And, um, you know, we know the current system isn't working. You know, sometimes I'll get pushback that people will say, well, well giving a technology solution to someone, that's second-class justice. And no, I don't think it has to be. It can be first-class justice. And let me show you how we can evaluate that. Let me show you how we can test these things. So I think, you know, the analogies to medicine are really good. And Jim Greiner at Harvard has written a lot about this. We can do randomized controlled trials. We can measure things. We can measure outcomes to better understand how these solutions work. And we're working with Rentervention here in Chicago. And the question is, is if you give someone this chat bot and they have a specific problem, how well can it do in making sure that the person gets the information they need, help them draft a demand letter, whatever it is that they need to do. And we can evaluate these things. And eventually I'd like to get to the point of doing RCTs where some people randomly either get the chat bot or a human lawyer and let's figure out what the outcomes are and let's keep improving these tools so we can say definitively, not only do I think that these chat bots can actually do very well in helping people solve specific problems, but look at these experiments that we've run, look at this data that we have, and we're gonna learn from that. I mean, part of what we're looking at here is the role of empathy in these chat bots, because sometimes people say, well, oh, these tools can't like develop the relationship with a person like that the human lawyer could. It's like, well, first of all, we don't measure that very well with what the humans are doing. We could probably improve what the humans are doing. Uh, but when we roll out technology, the technologies are, are more capable than people recognize, and they're going to keep getting better. And let's bring good, sound social science methods to this to better understand how these tools work and keep improving that. You raise an interesting point there because you're talking about the computer, the technology being empathetic and, and trying to help solve these problems. But then I also saw you wrote in an article, you say, developing tools that automate and augment legal tasks provides lawyers with more time to employ emotional intelligence, still unique to lawyers, and give creative and strategic advice when handling quiet matters. What's the distinction there? What is it that a lawyer can do with their emotional intelligence that you can't build into the tool? Well, and to be clear, right, I mean, it's, it's like this experiment that we're doing right now. It's being intentional about using empathic language and using that in a way that can help develop a, a connection with the human, right? Versus just very plain, neutral sort of language. Of course, humans are far better at this than any chatbot 
is that we could design right now. But, you know, a lot of times, even for humans, we don't necessarily do a lot for lawyers to help them develop these skills. There's, without a doubt, you think about legal aid services, there's going to be certain scenarios where you're going to want to have a human working with the person who's running into a problem, right? Like me, there might be certain family law areas uh, where someone experiences a problem and it's, and it's more the idea of like, well, let's just let them know the facts and the forms they need to file and they can work this kind of thing out. There's certain sort of family law matters that are very messy and difficult. Right. And the idea that you're going to automate that, I mean, no, not likely, right? Are there, there are pieces of work around that? You might be able to use technology so that a given lawyer um, or legal aid person then can be more effective at, at getting the work that needs to be done, but then spending the time counseling the person, understanding what's going on, making sure they get the other resources that they might need to be able to get through this difficult situation, right? So those are the, the distinctions that I would draw. And I assume too, this study is kind of feeding into a point you've made time and time again, that it's not that lawyers don't want to use automation. It's had such a modest impact so far, just because a lot of the work we do is unstructured, is, you know, <laughs> there's no industry standards, like there's no Kanban board showing every step of the way. So what you're trying to do with these chatbots, right, is kind of like systematize these things, right? That's a part of it, right? And, and so I think that if you better understand kind of what it is you need to do to provide a service to someone, um, this is why I think a lot of organizations that have been successful in doing this have applied lean thinking or, you know, process mapping and like, let's really understand what it is that, that we do. And if your, your approach is kind of a tech first approach, I think you're going to have a lot of, a lot of challenges, right? You start running into all these issues as far as, you know, what is it we do for people when and why? And, and, and if you can't, if you kind of can't answer those questions, it starts getting difficult to build. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting because I think there's a little bit of a debate sometimes, at least that I see on Twitter, right? And I get maybe my echo chamber on Twitter where it's, uh, you know, this idea of like a tech first or like, oh, forget about the technology. Just, you know, think about good client service. And it's like, well, I, th I really think we have to be doing both, right? We need to be thinking about both. Oh, yeah. And the best technologists understand that, right? There's no question tech can help customer service. Like what well, you've seen these studies from Clio where literally two thirds of inquiries to lawyers go unanswered, be it new client or even existing clients. Just, I'm not talking like crazy earth changing technology. I'm talking like, just like maybe set up some email responders or something or like ways to remind you to, to reach out. So no, tech can definitely help client services. Part of this is project management. Right. Um, I mean, clients, one of the biggest complaints is their lawyers not getting back to them. But even just thinking about in a big firm, having a good project plan so the client knows when you're going to be sending them information right. and then using tools that can help that be easier to, to gather that information and, and get it to the client. You pointed out too that it really isn't a question of tech first, law first. It's both. It's legal and computational experts working together and learning a little bit about each other's area so we can create these solutions. In a perfect world, how does that work? How can computational experts work with legal experts and start to solve some of these problems? I mean, I think ideally, right, you would have multidisciplinary teams and they'd be given, you know, our innovation lab, we're trying to model that. And I think there's still a problem in some organizations where the, and maybe particularly law firms, I think corporate legal departments are a little bit better at this, but there's still a problem in legal departments where if you're not a lawyer, you are not really empowered the same way in the no. organization as if you're a lawyer, right? And so what we really need is to recognize the value that that technologists and data analytics experts and others bring and really empower them inside of our organizations to, to be, you know, to take ownership and, and to feel pride in improving the things we do as an organization. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting that since I've moved from the law firm world to private practice to the business world and running my own business, it's always interesting to me how lawyers will listen to their expert witnesses. Let's say it's a forensic accountant. Even if a lawyer has some sort of good accounting skills, they're still going to listen to this expert witness and they hire experts to help them work on their cases and legal projects and, and whatnot. But it doesn't seem to apply that same level of respect or not even respect or just like they don't listen as much to like the project manager or other people that have expertise. So in this situation we're talking about here, technologists, you know, they don't, I just don't feel like they're held in the same esteem for whatever reason. It's something that's got to change. 
You know, one of the things that we we need to get better at, though, too, in this space, I think, is recognizing some of the nuance, right? And I do think, like, I well, just another example. I hear frequently people say, "Oh, big law firms, they're not doing anything. They don't want to change." They're no, there actually are some big law firms that I think are being pretty intentional about doing some meaningful things in this space and, and changing the way they do things. And some of those organizations are getting much better at this kind of thing where they actually, right. you know, people inside of the organization are empowered. They're part of the team. You've got people in these roles, legal solutions, architects, project managers who are actually brought to client meetings, right? And, and the clients respect them. The team respects them. So I, I do think we've seen quite a bit of change. We're not even nearly where we need to be, but it's important to recognize that this is happening in, in some places, but yeah, for a variety of reasons, it's not happening often enough. So let's talk about using tech in, in the legal practice, not, not to solve the bigger problems. Let's kind of switch the focus just a little bit. Let's talk about AI in the use of legal practice. I know it's near and dear to your heart, but I saw an article you wrote about the ethical implications of using AI in a legal practice as a practicing lawyer. You know, one of the things you mentioned is the duty of keep client confidence is confidential, the duty of competency to make sure you understand the tech you're using. But one of the things I thought was very interesting was the lawyer's duty to get informed consent from your client to take certain actions. How is that implicated by AI? Well, I think it's it's an interesting question. So I did a couple of programs for uh, general counsels at large firms, then medium-sized firms. And this is something we talked about a lot, right? I mean, AI is everywhere right now. Like we don't need to get permission from our clients to be able to use AI to use spell check in documents, right. right? I mean, there's certain things that it's just, it's standard practice. There's a variety of questions that can come up around this as far as like, if we're worried about the accuracy of how we might be using uh, different tools, right? If we're using in e-discovery or in, or in diligence, I mean, it's probably a best practice to make sure you're talking to your client and your client understands the way that you're using a technology tool and what are the risks and benefits, right? That's what's required right. as a lawyer and for your duty of competence to understand the risks and benefits under Rule 1.1 Common 8. I think that we're also entering a space where there's more and more uh, expectations of lawyers to affirmatively use these technologies because it starts getting into questions about whether you're charging a reasonable fee or not. Certainly, there's e-discovery matters where if you did it the old, you know, the old way, the, the manual way of marking up, even if they're electronically stored documents, people would say, well, wait a second, you could use technology to review or at least keywords or something here to right. try to call, you know, and if you didn't do that, now you're charging your client an unreasonable fee by charging all these manual hours to, to review documents documents. You know, and part of this is just what you should be doing as a good lawyer anyway, is just kind of staying in touch with the, with the client and kind of letting them know what you're doing in their matter, how, how you're staffing it and, and how you're handling it. This is what got me thinking though. And you, you kind of hit on some of it there. Like, you know, we already use an AI, some of a spell check and we are not asking our clients whether we can, of course, right. you know, but then I started thinking about, all right, historically, let's go back to the nineties or early 2000s. Historically, we didn't go to our clients and go, you know what? We got three choices here. Lexus, Westlaw, or human beings. You know, here's the pros and cons. So I'm just wondering, like, are these kind of new ethical obligations you think that are rising because of technology? Because at some level, you know, the way we did business, we didn't go and ask our clients if that's the way they wanted it to be done in the first place. Like, you know, we're going to look at this jurisdiction law versus, you know, doing the worldwide search, like things of that nature. Well, there was, there's been one prominent change, right? And that's the introduction of comment eight that talks about the benefits right. and risks of technology, right? And, and some people say, you know, that's much ado about uh, you know, nothing. Does it, has it really changed the obligation? You know, part of this is good client service versus what are your actual ethical obligations? And, I mean, it's probably a good idea to continue to, to have a conversation with your client about, about what tools you're using. But as you point out, right, I mean, as the lawyer, we have great discretion. Right. Once the client has told us what the ends is, right, what are we supposed to achieve for the client? The means for us to get them there, the lawyer has great discretion in doing that. But where the problems can come up, of course, I mean, there are rules about the fees that you charge the client. So if you choose one particular manner of getting there, and for example, doing something in a manual way when technology could have helped you, you might end up in a problem there. I think many of the problems here are much more practical than they are necessarily ethical challenges. I mean, confidentiality right. and doing your due diligence, where is it stored? You got to understand how well these things work and, and um, is, is another potential 
uh, issue around this, right? If you're going to use a tool for doing due diligence, I mean, one of the interesting things here is we've kind of always just assumed that when humans do it, it's perfect, right? And and then right. mythology is blown away. We know it's not perfect, right? But we think it's a good idea to, to talk with your, your client and kind of say, hey, we can use this technology tool based on the testing that's been done. Here's what it looks like, what accuracy looks like, the way we're deploying it. You know, we're not going to get everything. We're going to miss some things. But we think if we use a mix of the technology tool and human review, I mean, this is just good standard practice. I mean, uh, you know, I wonder how many times this has come up already, right? Because we're not going to see a lot of press about this, I don't think, because probably the most likely what's going to happen is if there's a dispute, you're going to tell your client, you're going to agree to take a haircut on, on the fees right. and then just kind of go, you know, move up, move along, right? But so right. I think a lot of this is around just good client communication and managing your client well. And the other thing I've seen you write about and, and talk about is the risk of bias in AI. Where do you see that in the legal world? Well, I mean, some of the places we see it is where it's already been cropping up. Things like um, in the criminal justice system, right? And, and talking about predicting recidivism. We've seen a lot of examples. I, even then, I think there's, again, going back to what is the status quo? The status quo isn't so great now. And how might we be able to use algorithms and data to actually improve so that there's more fairness and less discrimination in those spaces. I think when we're delivering legal services, we're just starting to, to scratch the surface to think about ways in which there might be bias in some of the things that we do. But this is why so much of this is context dependent. And sometimes when we think about it at a high level, right, we like tend to think we, first of all, we tend to correlate bias with, with discrimination, right? And, and like in some of these studies, um, you know, which with this, you know, abhorrent discrimination between different groups. Um, it could be, though, that there's different kinds of biases, like maybe we make a contract generation tool that just happens to be biased because of the way it was trained and, and draft contracts that work better for one industry than another or tend to favor, you know, one type of, of party than another. I think that we've got a lot of work to do to just ask sound questions about the design, the development, the validation, the deployment of these tools to just at least start thinking about, well, what kind of biases are there going to be in these tools? In what ways is the data biased? In what way that we're, you know, we design the algorithms, might there be some biases baked into these tools? You wrote not too long ago that AI presents an opportunity to improve our existing approaches to fundamental principles of justice, including the ways that we approach fairness, accountability, and transparencies. Computational technologies offer the distinctive capability to embed law, regulations, respect for human rights, and democratic principles directly into process, products, systems, and platforms by design and default. That's kind of what you're talking about there is like asking questions about bias at some level and, and things of that nature, right? Yeah, but I think I'm, I'm talking about something even, even more there. So the, the National Science Foundation has put out some calls for research projects around kind of, you know, the way they described it is we've always thought as, of humans being accountable under the law, but now more and more we're developing software systems and, and, and other products in the world, autonomous vehicles, that we expect to understand certain legal regulations and comply with them. And, and I think that's really exciting, right? And, and, and it's thinking about, well, how do we design these tools and products in a way that, that we can ensure that by design, uh, that, that it's respecting human rights, it's respecting the law, things like that. But what well, one step further than that, I think one of the things that's kind of interesting, right, is if we're thinking about uh, creating software tools uh, that, that actually reckon, understand the law and can comply with it, um, what, it would be a little bit absurd if we ended up in a world where we had technology tools that kind of understood the law that applies, but yet your average person in the street has no idea, right, like how security deposits work or, or you know, what the law is that applies to them. And so, I mean, I, I would love to see us, you know, there's a lot of pushback about some of these different ideas on, on how much of law can be embedded into one of these systems to create an expert system to help people solve specific problems. And my bet is that it's a lot, lot more than, than what we see now, right? Why can't we create systems that help people better understand what their rights are, but also what their obligations are? I agree. Uh, so I, I think 
that's where that is coming from is this idea like what we can create these tools and i think a lot of the time we get focused on well we need to give people the perfect answer to whatever their their situation may be but one of the things we do as lawyers right we go through that calculus we try to understand well what is the law that applies and uh, we make predictions right about what we think a court might do what the outcome might be and i think that more and more we are capable of developing systems that can do these things for end users in landlord tenant right we're doing some of these projects in the landlord tenant space that is a space where we absolutely should be able to create tools that can really help people understand again what their obligations are what their rights are and then make sure they're doing the things in a proactive way right. to secure their rights um, um, and fulfill their obligations so that doesn't get in the way of securing their rights in the future I agree. By making it algorithmic, you're cutting down on these variables that really, when you get to the heart of it, shouldn't be variables. You know, like, here's the situation. You know, <laughs> here's what the tenant is obligated to do. Here's what the landlord is obligated to do under the law. And here's how we should proceed, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the great things about law, and people talk about this all the time, is the flexibility of law, right? And it can be. But th there are some downsides sometimes where we've got flexibility in some areas or, or the discretion we might give to judges. And we see ways in which where there's a lot of discretion is where we see sometimes the discrimination or the, the bias in the right. outcomes that we want to see. And it's surprising when you look at landlord-tenant law, right? I think so one of the things if we really want these tools to work well is, is it also might require us to clean up the law in some, right. some areas, right? And make sure that the law is clear. But a lot of these areas, I, one of the pushback, pieces of pushback you'll hear there is you'll say, well, this is by design, right? And this might have been through, uh, you know, some of the negotiation that get a lot right. passed. But, you know, I, I think there are a lot of areas where if we understood the ambiguities and, and the vagueness that was in some of these areas, we could figure out kind of like, well, how should the law actually be operating in this space and make sure people understand that and make it a lot easier reduce the transaction costs of complying with the law and making sure that we get the kind of outcomes we want to see. Right. And that's kind of the, the Suskind, Suskind's point, right? You know, on one extreme, you have bespoke law. On the other extreme, you have like just, you know, run of the mill stuff that's the same every time. And I think his point is we as lawyers have historically thought more stuff was bespoke than really is. It, most stuff can be boiled down to less discretionary questions, right? Well, and shifting as much of that as possible, moving in that direction. And, and like even, so one of the pieces of research I've done is this law firm innovation catalog. And one of the reasons why I started working on that several years ago, and I'm, I'm working with some students on updating it now, is that there are these anecdotes, again, the law firms aren't doing anything. Oh, but when they are doing stuff, it's just like trust in estates, there's nothing else happening. Well, no, that was wrong five years ago, and it's even more wrong today. And why is that? Well, because even if you look at the fanciest things going on, right, look at Elon Musk and Twitter right now. Okay. These are, uh, you know, new sorts of filings and bring up some new sort of issues. But of course, there's all kinds of work related to any sort of a transaction like that that's been done and it's been done many times. And there are components of this that are repeatable. You can perfect it, right? You can make it work right. better. And by doing that, you create more opportunities. You empower, right? Yeah, you know, lawyers are, seem to get very worried about this idea that they're going to be replaced by these tools. And I think there are tasks and there are more and more tasks that will become less important that the lawyer who is doing the work in the front line does that work. But what it does is it frees those individuals right. up to think about, well, what are the other things I can do in connection with this to provide even greater value? Because I know when I was practicing, I don't know that I ever encountered a matter where I wouldn't have loved to have a little bit more time right. working the things that I think really produce value. But there's so many things that where there's a lot of friction and that we, you know, we just got to do, but we know maybe aren't, aren't actually that they have to be done, but they aren't the things that add are going to really make a difference at the you know end of the matter. Right. Agreed. And here's what I struggle with too, is especially on these tools that people are building or the, the way people are changing laws to address access to justice issues. Like I remember being at a bar association meeting a couple years ago. Well, it's probably about five years ago now. We were talking about the um, limited uh, practitioners up in Washington. They were limited like, licensed think, legal technicians. Yeah, yeah. Yes. LLTs. People were up in arms about that. Well, you can't let these people that aren't lawyers do this. And in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking, you're not doing this work anyway. So what is your objection? Because they can't pay for it and you're not working for free. So why do you really care that this is happening? So that's what I struggle with when people push back on that. You know, the barriers that are put up 
don't make any sense. This upsolve litigation in New York has been interesting. It'll be interesting right. when it goes up on, on, on appeal. But then you've got in Florida, right, the, the tick, right. the TIKD, uh, that went the other way. And, you know, it's really frustrating to me to see the barriers that lawyers are putting up. And they've got virtually zero basis, right, in making these assertions. And then there's misinformation about these triple LT programs. They got shut down in the state of Washington, unfortunately, but there's a good study out of Stanford talking about the data behind it. And I saw someone tweeting on uh, Twitter the other day, like, oh, well, no one wanted to be a triple LT and there was no demand for their services. No, wrong, wrong, yeah. right? There are facts to the contrary out there. Go look at the facts, right? So we, we need more experimentation like this. If we want to democratize law, which is something as lawyers we talk about, right? Like read the <laughs> preamble to the rules of professional responsibility. Let's do some of the doggone things that we say we're supposed to do. And one of the things includes expanding access, improving access to justice, these things. And there's some tremendous opportunities in this space. And so technology is a piece of it, but also thinking about redesigning the service model. Yep. And the idea that, that, I mean, I can go handle a family law matter right now, right? I'm licensed to do it. I'm allowed to go do it. And so you mean to tell me that I'm better equipped to do that than someone who got a triple LT and, and had like a year's worth of training on just family law matters? I mean, we both went to law right. school. We know how it goes, right? If you had one year of specialized training, that person, I mean, for sure, we can figure out how to define the boundaries of what that person can do. And we can you know, make sure that they're going to uphold a certain ethical code. There's nothing special about us as lawyers that we're the only ones who have ethics in the world, right? We can, right. We can empower other people to help, help solve and, and help you know, serve society by helping people with these problems. Agreed. You know, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there, Dan. Uh, <laughs> we got to keep pushing, right? Yeah, we do have to keep pushing without a doubt, without a doubt. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, so it's, it's nice to see signs of progress. We got to highlight those and, and, um, you know, we should be talking about where we're not seeing progress and, and, uh, you know, we shouldn't fall back on the assumptions. It's a little bit unfair to just, you know, beat up on, on the lawyers. I would like to point out, we got to have some more discussions about this. Like what are the obstacles and, um, how can we overcome them and just make it more and more, apparent, right? To like, right. this is how the way we can move forward. And then, um, you know, people who want to obstruct, <laughs> we're going to have to move beyond that. Yep. Well, Dan, appreciate your time. Keep fighting the fight. If people want to get a hold of you or learn more about your research, find the some information about some of the stuff we talked about today, where do you want to send them? Yeah. Twitter, Dan Lina, uh, on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn with the same handle. And then it's easy to find my blog, Legal Tech Lever, or my bio at Northwestern University. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. Also, if you like us enough, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.